Welcome to CXO Talks. We are delighted to have Jenny Chen join us today. Jenny Chen is a highly experienced professional specializing in internal audit, IT audit and advisory, business resilience and risk management. She has a diverse range of expertise and has held various leadership roles throughout her career. Currently, Jenny serves an internal professor at Singapore Management University. She is also the president of the Zaka Singapore chapter. Jenny's achievements and contributions have been widely recognized, and she has received several awards. Jenny's expertise and accomplishments make her a valuable resource for discussions on cybersecurity, business resilience, and risk management. With her experience in leadership and people development, she can provide insights into transformational leadership and operational risk excellence. Welcome to this EXO Talks show, Jenny. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be on this uh, particular session. Um, very humbled and very honored that um, you know my little contributions to the society and community get some um, acknowledgement, and that I can, uh, or perhaps I should say, I hope to share my experiences so that people can gain um, better um, learning outcomes. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Jenny, uh, to just start, uh, if you can. Uh, start by sharing a bit about your journey and expertise in the field of cybersecurity. Yeah, so to start off with, um, actually, uh, I didn't get into the cybersecurity immediately. So when I started off my career, that's about 20 years ago. Um, now you know how old I am. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, I started off as a software engineer uh, uh, because, uh, well, I studied artificial intelligence back then, but it was not a hype thing. Yeah, it's not a trendy thing back then as compared to the current situation. So I made use of my skill set, entered the software engineering field, and from there on, um, the cybersecurity came into the picture about uh, perhaps I would say ten years ago that it really set the scene. And how I got into it is mainly um, from a tech risk perspective. Yeah, so I actually evolved from my role from a line one, which is software engineer I mentioned, and I evolved into a line two and three role, which is into tech risk and tech audit. And tech is a very big word um cybersecurity is part of it and it cannot be you know excluded so that's how i've gotten myself um into the realm of cybersecurity yeah. so uh cybersecurity as uh, you also mentioned that it's a rapidly evolving field so what notable changes or trends have you observed in the cybersecurity landscape over the past few years and how have these developments impacted organizations okay I would see that um, the major shift in cybersecurity is really from a very basic use of internet on the network security side. Um, it has shifted to encompass the digital aspects of things. Um, and it's not just about digital and even other aspects of technology came into the picture. So in the past, um, cybersecurity mainly concerned with, you know, IT, where it's really enterprise technology that we're using in our corporate offices, as well as very direct um, uh, IT um, equipment or devices that we are using, like laptops or notepads, you know. Um, but as times have evolved, um, now we are concerned with the, the very faint line between the digital technology aspects of things versus the IT. So like, for instance, our mobile, uh, you know, the mobile phones that we're using, we are having a lot of uh, digital apps on our phones. And these apps actually interacted not just with your phone alone. Um, some of the apps actually do have some internet connectivity. Um, so it became a, a hybrid kind of um, uh, integration approach. So that has actually caused cybersecurity to, to be more difficult uh, to enforce. And other than the digital aspects, I'm sure you have heard a lot of scandals or a lot of um, incidents that have happened on the utility uh, grids kind of thing. So that's where the operational technology came into the picture. And as we also, as human beings, we want to progress with um, using technology to address productivity issues like, you know, our smart homes, smart cars. Yeah, all these um, IOT kind of uh, um, uh, concept also came into the picture. So now the whole cybersecurity space is no longer so straightforward. It is very convoluted and very integrated, and it's very difficult to manage. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, cyber threats are going in sophistication. Uh, if you can shed some light on emerging threats that organizations should be vigilant about, and uh, what proactive measures can they take to enhance their cybersecurity resilience? 
Yeah, so I think from an organization's perspective, um, uh, as a risk specialist, I would think uh, to me, I would want to caution um, the organization about um, the way they embark or adopt emerging technologies um, tools uh, in the organization. So having said that, doesn't mean that um, organizations should not use uh, emerging tools, right? The new ones, yeah. But rather, uh, should not just jump onto the, the, the bandwagon just because um, everyone says so. So so the threats could likely come from, and from research, it has already proven that um, almost 80, above 80% of all these um, cybersecurity breaches came from users ourselves, yeah. So, so that would mean that, you know, when the organizations are adopting all these new technology tools, they need to, first of all, assess whether their various aspects of users' roles, are they ready yeah, to take on? And you're asking how to, how to manage or mitigate such um, risk uh, um, emerging from all these um, choices, right? Um, I think nothing beats training. But then, unfortunately, human being, human being, um, you know, the moment you walk out of the classroom, or the moment you shut down your your virtual training, you retain less than ten percent of what you have just learned. Yeah, so I mean that is typical. So this kind of training and awareness um, has to be continuous and cannot be a one time classroom training or a one time uh, webinar, for instance. I think the organizations should build in a program that uh, uh, to develop risk culture throughout, and not just about uh, a, a typical one time off kind of training sessions. Um, so so any. Any organization, if let's say if I have the capacity to to dictate, let's say a uh, uh, um, uh, a mandate for anyone who wants to implement a new tool, I would think that they have to go through uh, tech risk one hundred and one kind of sessions, right, to make sure that they are aware what they are going to embark on the journey. Um, it's not stopping them, but rather know what you know and know what you don't know as well, right? So so that you know your risk can be mitigated, um, cost benefit can be weighed properly. And, uh, you know, reputational risk can be also contained. Yeah. So you emphasize on having a drill uh, before uh, executing any new tools or, uh, you know, uh, to improve the cybersecurity posture of an organization. Yeah. And it's not just a drill, but I would think that um, if the organization has an ongoing program, that is no longer a drill, right? Um, so, so perhaps, um, uh, you know, you can complement it by a checklist item as in, um, you know, the person who's going to implement something, um, at least you are satisfied about the risk that you're going to take and you have put in place minimum, um, baseline controls to address those risks. So, so what I'm trying to say is enter with your eyes open. Yeah. And know where are your, your risk threshold. Yeah. So, so that at least if you get burned, uh, you won't complain, right? Yeah. And nothing is hurt, you know, because you are prepared to do that. Rather than you know closing both eyes and very blindly, and um, you, you are not sure what kind of other tech risks that you are introducing into the ecosystem, uh, just because you didn't do your part properly, yeah. So it's kind of a forecasting or foreseeing. Uh, yeah, I would say there's no one solution for all. It has to be a, a hybrid approach. Yeah, yeah. So the shortage of cybersecurity talent is a global concern. How yeah. can organizations and educational institutes collaborate? to bridge this skill gap and nurture the next generation of cybersecurity professionals? Yeah, um, cyber talents are really, really uh, limited. So I think to me, I would say that there would be uh, two levels of address. So I think the first level I just mentioned earlier in my um, response to your question. So first level, definitely, uh, while you don't have enough people to help guard um, the, 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 the parameters for you, you have to make sure your internal people, existing people, are trained in such a way that they appreciate risk and they understand what risk can cause them. Okay, so at least you have, like, a, you know, in a football match, right? You have the defender, right? So at least you know your defender must know uh, what to defend. So that um, cannot be just restricted to the cyber talents. It it has to be everybody because risk is everybody's responsibility, right? So then, um, to address the actual people doing the cybersecurity work. I think um, there are many ways, um, other than working with schools, uh, you know, like providing, being more proactive in providing attachment programs, internship programs to, to encourage people to, to, to come in to contribute accordingly. Other ways could be, you know, um, converting, converting people from non-tech to tech, um, the risk kind of um, uh, role. Um, it's possible, um, especially if, let's say, um, you are working with, um, you know, a certain technology association just like ours. Um, you know, we work with a lot of professionals, a lot of organizations, because we don't represent any organization. 
but we represent the um, uh, the professionals in this uh, technology risk space. Um, we're helping one another to to develop newer talents from you know those non tech people to embrace governance etc to be able to support the the current lack of yeah of course you still need a the, the actual group that have the real technical skills to deal with the very complex issues but i think um i would say again it's not a one size fits all and it cannot be a one time effort um if the three three points that i've just mentioned the internal defenders as in the organization to build a, a proper tech risk culture then the other one is to be able to have programs to help convert uh, non-tech people to tech people to deal with the lower end of the cybersecurity work. I think that would help while, you know, we, we, we groom the real technical specialist um, into this field. So if these three dots can be connected, I think um, uh, it's not a big problem to deal with. But um, if none of the dots can even be formed on its own, we have a big issue. <laughs> yeah. So that was really been articulated nicely and the example was quite relatable of the defense of the football match. <laughs> so that was really nice. So as you also uh, agree that, uh, you know, we have a humongous amount of data generated now because of the IoT and uh, lots of smartphones now. Um, so uh, compliance with uh, data protection regulations is a top priority for many organizations. How do you recommend businesses navigate the complex landscape of data privacy and uh, ensure compliance with evolving regulations? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, let me see. I would say that um, for, for data privacy to be effectively controlled, um, there there is a requirement on inventorizing, you know, what is it that we're dealing with from an information security perspective? So, um, as an organization, um, do you know your data landscape? Do you know your information, you know, security landscape? Um, all these things needs to be documented, um, evaluated, and risk rated. I think that would have to start with. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have unlimited budget. We don't have unlimited resources. So that's why I said that first of all, we need to have the big picture. So take out that blueprint, uh, understand what what is um, uh, uh, accounted for within your whole organization spectrum. And once you have addressed the risk weighting of everything, then you zoom in to really um, secure them from from a risk-based uh, approach. Yeah. So when we talk about data privacy, uh, again, you can't run away from the technical aspects. So uh, once you know which are your crown jewels, and also based on your organization's operating jurisdiction. Yeah. So, so like, you know, I know India just implemented your data protection act, right? Yeah. Um, and Singapore has our own, China has their own. So every country has their own. So after you know your inventory, then you have to do your, do your risk rating and then you have to compare against from a regulatory perspective. Um, what are the regulations that you're exposed to? Yeah. So once you have this big matrix, then you can start implementing the security measures on it, yeah. So, like I said, if it's crown jewels, you really need to have maybe a set of um, uh, security measures to control it. Like, for instance, a very tight encryption methods, or you know, uh, uh, even contractual um, uh, penalties in terms of sanctions, etc. So, these are things that you have to deal with. So, you have to, you know, restructure them into um, uh, all this respective zone based on what I just commented about uh, about a full inventory study of things. Yeah. Then uh, once it's done. You have to attack the the software again. The software I'm talking about here is not the uh, programming software. Um, it's really the human software again. Yeah. So earlier on, uh, I already stressed about training the risk culture. So if this has been done well, then this is not a big problem. But organizations generally don't do this piece well. So I think it is still an ongoing effort that we encourage organizations to step up. I think finally, it's really um uh, to deploy the auditors. To help the organization do a, you know, check and balance kind of thing, yeah. So, so you, everyone will say that okay, I follow, I follow. But the reality is, how much I follow versus how much you follow, different definition, yeah, different capacity as well, right? Yeah. So that then, there is a big gap on interpretation of what I'm following versus what you are following. So that's why uh, I think auditors are good uh, resources to come in to help the organization perform health checks, right? To see where we are. So again, um, you, you can't run away from the three lines of defense kind of model where everybody has to collaborate. 
Um, everyone has a role to play, but we have to collaborate to ensure the organization's um, uh, data privacy or even um, uh, information security um, standards are being uphold. Yeah. Yeah. So you mean the cyber security of NS is crucial not only for professionals, but also for the general public, or we can say the non-technical employees also. Yes. But uh, there comes the issue of change management. Uh, it's kind of difficult to make uh, the non-technical uh, employees understand because they got a mindset of that, okay, what's for me in this kind of, you know, approach? And why should I? It's it's uh, quite technical. Why uh, I've been asked to get into all these things. So uh, if you can shed some light on, uh, uh, you know, uh, best practices for change management or how organizations can uh, do a better change management in their, uh, in their organizations. Yeah. Um, I like to do this in a workshop and my workshop, I like to do a lot of scenarios play. Yeah. So I forced the so-called uh, workshop participants who are non-technical users to sit through and think about it. You know, you have to give them, um, uh, uh, paint them a picture about what, what they're using now, how they're using it. And then you take away all these uh, privileges and show them something that they are being uh, caught in a situation. How would they react so far? Uh, I think uh, those workshops I've conducted worked quite well because when people are being forced into a scenario, they are forced to think about things that um, they took it for granted. They took it so easily. Yeah. So, so, so I think in order for people to to change, is it's not a one day effort. It's also not a one workshop effort. But uh, a good workshop can help to wake up people. Yeah. That you know, uh, while yes, you're not technical, but it doesn't mean that you don't work in an organization. You don't need an organization and you don't have an employee-employer role to play to protect the organization. So if everybody looks at their uh, employment contract carefully, why is there a confidentiality clause? You know, because you are part of the organization. Your One of your duties is to ensure company's interest, right? Uh, to protect information from the company. So um, if you don't play a part in this whole risk management and change management um, uh, requirement, you're not fulfilling your duty as a, a, a good employee, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's more like putting them, in, conducting such workshops and uh, making them have a uh, experiential learning kind of. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> correct. You're right. Experiential. Yeah. Okay. So technology is both a threat and a defense in the cybersecurity ring. How do you see emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain? Impacting cybersecurity strategies and what opportunities and challenges do they bring? Yeah, so uh, personally, I don't really believe in technology solving technology problem, but I do believe that technology can support in solving uh, technology problems. So there's a slight difference because um, you know the moment you introduce more technology into the ecosystem, um, there are more complexities in the cyberspace that you're going to deal with. Yeah, so so. Like, for instance, for AI, um, definitely I agree that if you have built the AI in such um, an outcome that it fulfills all your risk, um, risk and controls criteria, then I say it's good to use. Yeah. But back to the same question, how many organizations or how many people, when they implement such things, they're aware? Yeah, they're not aware. So, 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 so they just talk and play. Um, that is a danger. But then um, if you want to do a bespoke one, it's just too expensive. Yeah. So my point is, um, uh, I don't disagree that uh, emerging tech like AI and blockchain can solve different types of um, technology risk issues, um, but um, don't anyhow uh, deploy them. Really know what your issues are first. And for me is, um, I like to do things in simple steps, in simple forms. You don't have to think too complex to, to address uh, a problem. Sometimes a, a very basic uh, method can resolve a very complicated problem. So, so I would advise anyone who wants to address any of these tech risks, highlight and identify what are the real tech risks you are addressing, and can this risk be addressed by a simple tool or a simple manual process or, or what? Before you even want to bring the giants in, yeah, to address something that is actually very small, yeah. So, 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 so these are, uh, I would say, maybe a lot of people would not understand or appreciate where I'm coming from because it looks like you know, uh, I'm. I'm not supportive of all this implementation. But on the contrary, I actually do believe technology does help because I'm someone who also likes to, uh, you know, do a lot of process improvement uh, with technologies. But 
uh, again, I just want to caution that um, uh, go in with your eyes open. Don't use a big knife just to cut a, you know, a very small thing. Yeah. Um, adopt the right fit approach, the right fit tool to address the, the risk that you're talking about. Um, you know, I think then um, it would address many other unknown unknowns. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, more like now switching the gears, we would like to uh, know your experience as the president of the Isaka Singapore chapter and what initiatives have you led or been involved in? Yeah. So um, as the president of Isaka chapter, uh, uh, the big thing that I've actually uh, introduced in from a um, uh, chapter perspective is the the issue that we address about the cyber talents. Yeah. So I've actually um, had this conversion program where I've converted people from non-tech to tech uh, GRC people uh, who now work in you know um, either cybersecurity or tech risk or tech auditors role. Yeah, in in reputable firms. So I think this is one area that I can, um, you know, on behalf of the chapter, help the society and the community to, to you know, improve and increase the number of um, cyber resources, yeah, to assist them. Then, of course, from the advocacy, advocacy perspective, um, our chapter has regular uh, webinars, programs, events, workshops to help people to gain additional knowledge about emerging technologies and how to use them. And at the same time, how to deploy, um, you know, the common standards like from the ISO, the NIST uh, sort of standards into the um, technology implementation within organizations. So, so we are there to play such roles to the professionals and the organizations they represent. Sure. So uh, these are more like your contributions to business resilience and risk management. Okay. Yes, um, we are running a crisis simulation workshop uh, next month. So. Okay. So it is something that is uh, very fun, but it's um, it's useful, yeah, to the industry. Yes. So, so lastly, you know, I would really like to know that how you balance your various roles and responsibilities, such as being an edging professor, president of Zaka Singapore chapter, and then director at PwC <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm also a woman and would would be glad to know that how are you balancing each and everything. <laughs> Yeah. So I think, uh, the most critical part is time management. That's number one. Uh, number two, it's, uh, you need to like what you're doing. So that, that's where, you know, you don't find it, um, a chore that a task takes away, you know, your time to spend on other things. Yeah. Uh, definitely, um, other than this too, the other thing is I try to leverage, um, all these things together. So while I lecture, it doesn't mean that um, I only do a one track, right? So I need I will lecture in in related subjects. So I'm still preaching and advocating all these tech risk matters, right? Yeah. So if I'm running my work, uh, my day job requires me to, to touch base with risk and audits. So I will have to, um, uh, you know, also capture all my stakeholders' attention to to put things into perspective. Um, so as the Asaka chapter president, uh, it it's just about you know trying to extend what i'm doing in school at work into uh the professional space yeah so so if you look at it actually there are interrelationships among them it's just that um perhaps the way i did it was instead of doing it linear you know next to each other i try to stack them up to find the commonalities to find the common points so that you know i i when i spend one hour in this item it it may not mean that i only do one thing at the same time so so i may be doing 1.5 or two things at the same time yeah achieving two objectives etc so that's how i manage it if not i don't think i can uh i can stand stand, stand uh, up here and talk to you <laughs> <laughs> to so you know to, to keep uh, encouraging people to come on board uh to deal with um such uh, interesting topic going forward Thank you so much for, you know, replying that question. <laughs> Time management is quite critical. <laughs> okay, planned. And how to connect all our works, you know, wherein we can have that commonality factor. So that's awesome. Yes. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Hexo Talk Show. And it was a complete pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure the Hexo TV audience is going to find this conversation quite insightful. Thank you. Thank you for having me in the first place. Thank you very much. No question. For more updates from CXO TV, please like and subscribe to our channel.